We want to remind our listeners that this program is for informational and educational purposes only and not intended to substitute for professional veterinary medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The Animal Medical Center does not recommend or endorse any products or services advertised by SiriusXM. Welcome to Ask the Vet with Dr. Ann Hohenhaus. This is the place to talk about your pets and get advice with a top veterinarian from the Animal Medical Center in NYC. Hear from the leading authorities on animals and ask your questions. Now, here's your host, Dr. Ann Hohenhaus. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad you can join me for another Ask the Vet podcast, a program for people who love pets. If I have any new listeners today, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Ann Hohenhaus. I'm a senior veterinarian and director of pet health information here at the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center in New York City, where I'm recording from today. Today's program, we have a special guest, Jane Kopelman, who serves as consultant to Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center's Caring Canines Therapy Dogs. Jane will share some of the amazing work these special dogs do each and every day, so I'm really looking forward to our conversation. But I have other stuff too, so stay tuned for our whole podcast. The Ask the Vet podcast is available on the Sirius app and also on all major podcast platforms, and you can also download it from AMC's website, which is www.amcny.org. Thanks to AMC's long-standing partnership with SiriusXM, this show keeps rolling on a monthly basis. To keep you updated on pet health information, we hope you'll like and follow this podcast, and hopefully you'll take a moment to give us a review. I'd like to remind everyone who's in New York City and might have a pet who has an emergency, that the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center is the only level one veterinary trauma center in New York City. And we are also the largest veterinary teaching hospital in the world. Do you have a question about your pet's health that you'd like me to answer? Just email me. I'll give the email. It's very easy to remember. Ask the vet at amcny.org. And I'll answer your question on next month's Ask the Vet program. Again, that's askthevet at amcny.org. And if you don't have a pen or pencil to jot that down, I'll give it again a couple more times in the show and you can find something to write with during the break. And now it's time for our trending animal of the month. It's time for the internet's most talked about animal. Actually, this month, it's more than one animal, and they're really big animals, too. The beloved giant panda family, Mei Zhang, Tian Tian, and their cub, Zhao Kuiji, will be leaving their longtime home at the Smithsonian National Zoo and return to China as part of the Giant Panda Cooperative Research and Breeding Agreement between the zoo and the China Wildlife Conservation Association. Then this agreement was made over 23 years ago. But the pandas have been at the National Zoo since I was actually a little girl. And I remember when the first panda came, we pleaded with my parents and they got us up very, very early in the morning to drive us to Washington, D.C. just to see the pandas in their new enclosure in the Washington National Zoo. So these three bears that are currently occupying that panda compound are going to make a 19 hour journey on November 8th aboard a specialized FedEx Giant Panda Express plane with National Zoo veterinarians and panda carekeepers who will bring food and activities for the bear. Because you know, on a 19 hour flight, it gets boring and you get hungry. So we're treating the pandas no different on the Panda Express. I love they're going by FedEx. I mean, who would have thought you could FedEx pandas? So while the bear's departure is gonna be really sad for the zoo caregivers, and all the people like me who have adored the pandas over the past decades, we're really proud of the work that they have done for the giant panda conservation, says Michael Brown Palsgrove, the National Zoo curator of the Asia Trail and giant pandas. The National Zoo has trained over 1,500 professionals in panda conservation and built a research framework for breeding and reproductive support for pandas in the wild. The National Zoo officials encourage everyone to see the giant pandas. They have panda cams uh, on their website. Just Google National Zoo Panda Cam. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's guest, Jane Kopelman. 
Jane is a certified professional dog trainer and an avid believer in the power of therapy dogs. Jane's been involved in pet therapy with her own dogs for more than 20 years. She's a certified therapy dog team evaluator, which the team is the person and the dog, and they have to be evaluated for their skills in providing therapy to patients. So that's what Jane does is she can assess you and your dog if you're ready to be a therapy dog team in a hospital or a classroom. She's evaluated and trained hundreds of therapy dog teams during her time as a certified therapy dog evaluator. Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center launched the Caring Canines program in 2007. And actually one of my neighbors, um, his name is Cooper. He's a little handsome chocolate brown dog. And he worked for many years at Memorial Sloan Kettering, which is just up the street from where I live. Jane has a mixed breed dog named Wally, and they were one of the first volunteer pairs in the program. And today she serves as a consultant for the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center Caring Canines program. Jane also, this is not in my script, but Jane also was a member of the Angel on a Leash board. And so that's where Jane and my lives crossed is that both of us served on that board, which was a therapy dog group here in New York City for a time. And I always loved the Angel on a Leash symbol, which was a cute little lavender dog. And then they had angel on a leash tattoos. And I would always get one at whatever event we were at because the clients loved that I had a purple dog tattoo on my arm in, when I was in the clinic seeing them. The Schwarzman Animal Medical Center is going to be honoring the Memorial Sloan Kettering Caring Canines at our top dog gala this year in early December. And so this is a preview um, for all of you who will be attending the Top Dog Gala about the work Caring Canines does. So Jane, that was a really long introduction, but I want to say that you've done a lot of great stuff, and I'm so happy that you could join me today on Ask the Vet. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I smiled when you started talking about um, Angel on a Leash. I still have a t-shirt. I still have an Angel on a Leash t-shirt that I wear all the time. It, those little purple dogs were so cute. So purple cute. So let's start at the beginning. Did you grow up with pets? Is that where your interest in therapy dogs started? I grew up with cats. Um, I did not have dogs growing up. Um, I grew up with cats, but I always, not my choice. Uh, I love cats, but not having a dog was not my choice. But I couldn't wait to be old enough to have a dog. So you and I are the opposite. We always had dogs. All I wanted was a cat. Mm -hmm. um, and Katie, my producer, and I are, are definitely cat people. But I still yeah. you know, adore the therapy dogs who do such great stuff. So then you grew up and you got a dog. And was that your first dog? Is Wally the therapy dog dog? Mm -hmm. Wally was not my first dog. I had I had a couple of dogs before Wally. Um, I um, and we'll talk. I I think a little bit about this later. What makes a great therapy dog? I had some dogs before Wally who were lovely, but would not make a great therapy dog. Um, but Wally Wally was um, a great therapy dog, and but not my first dog. So then. Was it Wally that motivated you to get involved in therapy dog work? He actually was, it came before Wally. I worked, I was working at the time at the ASPCA in Manhattan. I was in their behavior department and um, they had a therapy dog program there at the time. And I um, became very interested in it. And I had a dog at the time who I, took through training to be a therapy dog, but discovered that there was a population of people she didn't really love. And so she, she was not going to be a therapy dog, but that's where my interest started. So then is your, what's your background? I mean, how did you get to the ASPCA? Do you have an animal uh, behavior degree? No, I got to the ASPCA. I was in another industry and I, um, I loved animals and they at the time did an internship program and I applied for it and I, um, I started interning there and the rest is history. 
So you started as an intern in the behavior group. Correct. Yep. Behavior is such, such an important thing. If you have a wonderful, lovely dog, then all is well. But but for people who have a dog that is having behavior issues, there are not too many people out there uh, available to pet owners. Uh, you know, in New York City, we've got, we only have one or two behavior veterinarians, which is really a deficit, I think, here in New York City. Uh, yeah, uh, true behaviorist, uh, veterinary behaviorists are few and far between. You're right. I think in the country, there aren't even all that many of them. There are, I'm a dog trainer by background. I, uh, the behavior department was mainly, well, it what we, you know, it was a training department and we did do some, you know, behavioral stuff, but it's, you're right. There are, um, there aren't, still aren't a lot of veterinary behaviorists. Yeah, it, it's really, it's one of the tiniest specialties within the profession. And there's so many behavior issues that it just seems like we're desperate for more. So let's go back to our therapy jogs. Talk about what makes a good therapy dog. And then how do you figure out that that cute dog that comes to your therapy dog class is actually the right dog to get trained for this job? So um, what I think is the most important thing when you're assessing a dog to see, is this a great therapy dog? Is, is the dog really social? Um, you know, does the dog really want to be around people, to greet people? Is the dog outgoing? Is the dog pretty okay with, you know, most kind of handling? You know, if someone pets them the wrong way, do they just say, well, that was a little awkward, but okay, I still like you. Um, is the is the dog okay with new environments? You know, um, there are a lot of dogs who are perfectly friendly and perfectly nice in the security of their own homes or in their own neighborhoods and but um have a harder time going into novel environments and being completely comfortable so good therapy dogs i think have to be outgoing they have to be social they have to be fairly confident so you know i've been into memorial sun kettering and there's all kinds of contraptions there to help people get around and get better. And those things a dog wouldn't normally see in your home or out on the street. So how do you get a dog used to the walker, the wheelchair, the IV pole, all that stuff that you see in a hospital? How do you prepare a dog for that? You prepare a dog by introducing it gradually and slowly and by associating it with something good. So um, there are dogs who are just out of the gate, not terribly nervous about things like that. But most dogs have some hesitancy. And so, you know, you pair food, you, you, you give the dog the choice of approaching when the dog's comfortable. You don't force the dog to approach and exposing the dog to those things in a positive environment and making it fun for the dog. Um, if there's any hesitancy, the dog will start to see this as not a really big thing. And, you know, distance is important. You know, if you're training a dog to be comfortable with a walker, you don't clomp the walker right up to the dog the first time you introduce the walker. You introduce it at a distance and you gradually get the dog used to it. So do you have a place where you you have practice stuff like this? I training have, dogs? I used to. I used to have a place in New York City. Um, I don't have my own place in New York City, but I do uh, I do do classes in New York City. I've done them on the Upper West Side at a dog and daycare center. I there's also a church basement that I have used to train therapy dogs. And um, there are um, there are several dog training places in, well, one that I know of who I think actually does do therapy dog classes. And there's certainly some outside of the city. But do they have, do you show up with a walker or a wheelchair and an IV yeah. pole? Oh yeah, you have to have those things in a therapy dog class, yeah. 
And you use them when you're evaluating a dog as well. You know, I evaluate for pet partners. There are other organizations uh, in New York City as well. But um, one of the requirements on the evaluation is that you use at least two pieces of health-related equipment. Interesting. So I bring my dog to you. What's the chance that my dog is going to make it? Like what percentage of dogs turn out to be good therapy dogs? Well, that's a really hard question to answer. I have, you know, I'm in a small slice of that. I would say that in classes, and I've never really sat down and did the numbers that carefully, but probably about 40% of the dogs will go on to actually take the test. Um, and once and dogs go on to take the test, some dogs don't pass the therapy dog test the first time, and they can take it again as long as there was nothing on the test that indicated that the dog really, really was uncomfortable with that kind of work. But it's not just about the dog, it's about the person too. Oh yes, absolutely. It is a it is a team effort. And um the person has to, I mean, the thing that I look for most with the handler, with the person, is do they read their dog well? Do they understand what their dog is saying at any given moment? And do they know how to direct their dog in such a way that maximizes their chance for success? So it's very much a team thing. And also with the handler goes in the people part of it, because certainly if you're visiting with your dog, you're visiting as a team. So the handler also has to have really good people skills and be friendly and outgoing. Well, and, and not freak out in medical situations, I, I would think. You yes, know, there's just, tough things not, happen in hospitals. Lots of things happen in hospitals. Um, obviously, I the program I work with is in a hospital. There are lots of other kinds of therapy dog programs, but that's the other thing you want to assess when you're evaluating a team. You want to assess should this team work in a hospital or maybe the team is more suited to work in a school program? So, so are... talk about a little bit about the other things, because for me, I always, maybe it's because I work in a hospital, but I'm always thinking about therapy dogs in hospitals, or maybe it's because hospitals are right down the street from where I live, but what else could therapy dogs do besides work in a hospital? Um, there are programs in schools for therapy dogs. Um, there are programs where children work with the dogs to build their con the children's confidence. They do all sorts of activities with the dogs. There are dogs who work in nursing homes. There are dogs who work in, you know, crisis situations uh, where dogs go in to comfort people who have been, you know, in a crisis situation, but uh, it's predominantly nursing homes, hospitals, and schools on a regular basis. The one, we had a couple of dogs uh, at Top Dog, I don't know, a few years back now, Rosie was one of their names. They were big St. Bernards and they were first responder comfort dogs. And they would go where there was a crisis to give the first responders, you know, a little love and a snuggle and some drool. And they were really cute. They, they were really big too. And the first responders really appreciated uh, those, those dogs. I really, my favorite program is read to a dog. First of all, because I think it's so important that children learn to read, number one. And number two, the, the dogs are so good at listening to children read. You know, they just like hang out with the kid. And if 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 all it takes to make your child a better reader is a dog, what a what a great deal as far as I'm concerned. I I, I just think those are the best programs. And I had a friend who had a dog that uh, did reading. Um there's a veterinary school that I visited that has therapy dogs on staff at the veterinary school. And when there's an, ex, you know, exams always seem to stack up. And there's a week of really bad, a lot of exams in a row, the therapy dogs go in and hang out. So the students can see a dog that's not sick. Cause sometimes it's really nice to see a dog that's not sick, um, which is, I see a lot of sick dogs and it's nice to see something that's healthy and fun and 
really pretty. Um, so talk about your experience as one of the first volunteer teams at Memorial Sloan Kettering. What was it like to get that program off the ground? So um, the program was started in 2007. And in 2008, I was teaching therapy dog classes at Bideway in Manhattan. And the person who ran the volunteer department there where I taught the classes said that someone from Memorial had contacted her and they were starting a therapy dog program. It had just gotten underway and they were looking for volunteers. And she said, I thought immediately of you and Wally. They asked me if I knew anyone. And I was very interested. And I went up to Memorial and the head of the volunteer department at the time interviewed me and, and Wally. And we got started there. Um, it was an incredibly rewarding experience. The, you, when you walk into someone, a patient's room and they're very stressed out, they're very anxious. And um, just to see their face brighten and for whatever period of time you're in the room with the dog, the person focuses on the dog and it brings a respite for whatever period of time that is from whatever might be on their mind might be bothering them. It's, it's a comfort, it's a respite. And so I, I did it and um, they decided at MSK in the volunteer office that they really uh, wanted someone to come on board and help who knew dogs and um, who could really help grow the program. And that's how I started. Are they still doing that? That They had a calendar of the therapy dogs one year that I saw. Do you still have that cute calendar every year? Um, we did not. The calendar did not happen during COVID and it hasn't started back up yet, but we have, we had many, many years of calendars. And yeah, they were terrific. Yes. They, so what happened to therapy dogs during COVID? Well, um, in hospitals, certainly programs went on pause and there were some nursing homes where they actually, I thought it was a pretty clever idea. Um, they would have dogs just go, you know, outside windows on the lawn and people could come to the window and look at the dogs. At Memorial, we started a virtual program on Zoom where patients could request a visit with a dog on Zoom and um and the dog got on Zoom. Um, we also did in a pediatric program where dogs once a week got on and did some tricks and did some stuff on Zoom. So the dog stayed present, but it was it was all virtual during COVID. So just for our listeners out there. So first we've talked about pandas going FedEx. Now we're talking about dogs on Zoom. Uh, look at how technology has impacted our pets, our animal companions so much uh, over the last years. Really um, remarkable. We, during the pandemic, when I had foster kittens, we would do adoption interviews over Zoom. And I would like put the kitten in front of the computer and then throw toys at it so the people could see it. And then I'd sit off camera because they weren't looking to adopt me. Although, I, I don't know, maybe some of those, some people probably would have been happy to have an adopted adult. Um, so we really just incorporate our pets uh, and animals into absolutely everything. So the caring canines really work with some of the sickest patients in the hospital. What can you tell me uh, a story or two about what makes these dogs so amazing each and every day? I think what makes them so amazing is, as I, I said before, um, the comfort they bring to people and the fact that many people, if they're hospitalized, they have pets at home that they haven't seen, that they miss very much. And the presence of a caring canine allows them to experience that connection that they're missing very much. Um, I've seen patients where um, the caring canine will appear and a patient will say that they have been waiting all day for the dog to come. Um, oh. You know, and so you see all the time how much these interactions mean to people. 
And the, the dogs do a phenomenal job. I mean, there are lots of studies, lots and lots of studies about dogs lowering, you know, lowering people's blood pressure and that kind of thing. But I, I will tell you firsthand, you know, you just see someone's face light up when a dog walks in a room or a child start giggling, you know, and just go completely outside of their um, experience of being in being ill and being in the hospital and the dogs do it every single time. So it was just Halloween. Did any dogs go dressed up in costumes for Halloween? Did you, were there any there looking cute in their little outfits? So that's, that's a really good question. Actually, most therapy dog organizations do not want dogs in costumes while they're doing visits. Really? Yes. Because it, do you think it frightens um, the partic- you know, the humans or what's the reason behind that? Do you know? Um, I think part of the reason behind it is that many dogs are not comfortable wearing costumes. There are some dogs who are, and there are some dogs who, you know, in their daily lives get dressed every day. Many dogs are not comfortable with it. And sometimes it can be a little awkward, um, you know, for people to handle a dog in a costume with things getting in the way, et cetera. So some of the organizations discourage that. Not all, but some. I never thought about that. You know, I just remembering that when my son was little, like I took him to the circus. I thought this was going to be like the greatest thing in the world. Let's go to the circus. Well, he was mortified. He hated the clowns. He was so scared of the clowns. And so I could see where a costume that was meant to be fun and entertaining on a dog would actually be frightening to some child who's already kind of frightened because they're in the hospital and not a good thing. So I I would have never thought about that. So I appreciate that, that comment. And um, probably a good point for our listeners that there are times when costumes are scary uh, to people and keep that in mind if you are getting your pet dressed up. Um, What about the Memorial Sloan Kettering staff? Those people have a really hard job. Are they happy to see your dogs coming through? They are so excited to see the dogs Um, on a lot of the floors. When you get off the elevator, the first thing you see in front of you is the nurse's station. (laughs) And I have gone up on floors with many, many dogs and almost everyone comes forward to say hello. The arrival of a new dog, a new team is always cause for a lot of excitement. Um, Staff request dogs for all sorts of celebrations, you know, to have the dogs join them. They are very, very popular with the staff. Well, my sister's a physician and she works in a psychiatric hospital and they have a therapy dog there. And I got a request from her one year because I often bake dog biscuits for Christmas gifts to my friend's Uh, who have dogs. And my sister was like, we have a therapy dog named Teddy and Teddy would like some of those biscuits. Do you think that you could ship me some biscuits for Teddy? I'm like, they're in the mail. But, you know, even my sister who comes from a veterinary family um, loves Teddy, the therapy dog that comes to her hospital. So it is a, um, I think that would be my off, one off experience is exactly what yours is, is that she's very happy to have Teddy the therapy dog come to visit. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So do therapy dogs ever get stressed? Yes, they do. Um, they absolutely do. And one of the things when I train teams and when I work with teams, that's one of the things I really talk a lot about is recognizing stress in your dog, recognizing when your dog is saying, I'm stressed out, I need a break, I'm not comfortable here. It's really important. And dogs, different dogs, I mean, there are common stress signals that we acknowledge in the dog world, yawning and lip licking and turning away and, um, you know, things that are commonly acknowledged as stress signs. But there are others. I had a dog once, um, not Wally, a different therapy dog of mine, and her signal to me that she was starting to get a little stressed out, that she needed a break, she would simply lie down make it really clear 
So that's one of the reasons it's so important to know your dog and know what your dog signals are. But absolutely, dogs get stressed. So for our listeners, what Jane says about stress therapy dogs, if you watch your own dog in my office or your veterinarian's office, you will see them lip licking, you will see them yawning, and you will see them kind of turn around and often you think they're looking at their tail for some reason, but actually they're, they're stressed and they're, they're turning around. Now there's nothing that I can do to make dogs not as stressed in my office. You know, I'm stressed when I go to the doctor too, but, but those are things for, for the pet owner to watch when they take their dog to the veterinarian is, is just watch them and see what their stress level is based on watching those behaviors in the office. So I'm hoping that Jane and my conversation today has some listeners interest peaked in possibly learning more about therapy dogs and maybe investigating the caring canine therapy dog program at Memorial Sloan Kettering. So if any of our listeners have their interest peaked about this, what do they do, Jane? So if your interest is peaked, you can go to mskcc.org and search for Caring Canines, and it will bring you to a Caring Canines page on our website. And that will direct you to how to um, get in touch and how to apply. And then how long (laughs) do you think it takes, Jane, from, I think I might want to become a therapy dog person with my dog. How long does it take from that thought to when you're working? Um, At MSK, you know, you you have to be registered with a therapy dog organization. The registration process varies slightly from organization to organization, but most times there's, you know, about a six to eight week training course involved. Then there's evaluations, there's veterinary clearance. You do have to, you know, your dog has to be up to date on vaccinations and your dog has to be examined by a veterinarian and um, be deemed healthy. And after that at MSK, I sit down and I, you know, there's an application and then I meet the team and then they get onboarded as a volunteer at MSK. And that process usually takes about four or five weeks to get onboarded through through the system. So seems like something you can accomplish a goal in less than six months to make all that happen. Yeah, this is the, I mean, most dogs come to therapy dog classes with some basic obedience. I mean, that it does assume that your dog has some basic obedience. Yes. So I'm hoping that your email box is going to be flooded with emails uh, come tomorrow morning for people I, who I have want, who, who've heard this show. And I just want to thank my very special guest, Jane Kopelman from Caring Canines at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center for joining us here today on Ask the Vet. And I'm going to look forward to seeing you at Top Dog Gala in December. Thanks so much, Jane. Good to see you again. Thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to December 11th as well. Thank you. And now we're going to take a quick break here on Ask the Vet. And when we come back, we will have your questions answered by me. And we will have the animal news. We're back with Dr. Ann Hohenhaus on Ask the Vet. Welcome back to Ask the Vet. Before we get started on the animal news, I just want to remind everyone that if you have a question about your pet's health, you can email me at askthevet at amcny.org. And I'll respond to your questions on next month's Ask the Vet podcast. It's time for Animal Headlines, the biggest animal news from across the world. Today's animal news starts with Stella, a beautiful 13-year-old golden retriever who lives in Sitka, Alaska. I've actually been to Sitka, Alaska. It has a beautiful Russian-style church there. And this dog amazingly survived 65 days alone in the Alaskan wilderness. Her journey began last July. A sudden burst of fireworks frightened Stella and she went running into the woods. 
just a reminder that 4th of July is one of the days where dogs get lost the most because they get frightened by fireworks. So be sure when 4th of July rolls around again that you've got your dog uh, contained somewhere where they can't escape because of the fireworks noise. So Stella's family searched all night without success and became especially concerned when a neighbor told them about a bear attack in the area. Remember, this is Alaska. The family continued their search throughout the summer, hiking those places familiar to Stella and kept it up, hoping she was alive somewhere out there. Finally, a couple months later, her family received a call saying that there was a sighting of a golden retriever near a quarry. And thankfully, it was Stella. Once Stella was reunited with her family, she started putting back some of the 30 pounds she lost while she was out in the woods foraging for her own dinner and recuperating from a wide gash in her left side, which her family is really worried it was from a bear attack. Happily, Stella is getting her groove back. And if you want to know more about Stella the Golden Retriever, just Google Stella in Alaska. So if you are mistaken that dogs are man's best friend, think about llamas. In the Northeast of the United States, there's a growing enthusiasm to have llamas as pets. Why? Well, llama owners say they're quiet, docile, and can be very affectionate. They have these soulful eyes, a huggable neck, and are easy to train. And if you're a knitter, you can't get enough of the llama fiber. P.S. It's not wool. I just want to remind everyone that in Peru, there are three more types of camelids besides the llama. There is the vicuna, the alpaca, and the guanaco. And for more on these and other Peruvian animals, you can check out my blog on the animals of Peru on AMC's website. Here in the U.S., llamas are fussed over pets that are shampooed regularly, rented out as photogenic wedding guests and golf caddies, adopted for companionship, and used as therapy animals compared to the South American llamas that haul corn through the mountainsides. According to Edward Bender of Lebanon, Connecticut, who raised llamas for 33 years, there's so much you can do with them. He likes to train his llamas to pull a buggy that people can ride in while his wife sells shawls and hats she's made out of the animal's coat. If you're a llama lover or just want more information, Google the New York Times and llamas for a great article and some amazing stories. Once you're a llama owner, you're then initiated into a tight-knit subculture of other llama lovers. Say that like 30 times, llama lovers. That's a, it's kind of like lava lamps. Llama lovers and lava, lava lamps. Ooh, that's really hard. Our last animal news story is for my cat-loving listeners. Turns out the cats may not be as aloof as you think they are. A news study published in the journal Behavioral Processes reports that cats are quite expressive, especially around other cats. Two researchers filmed 53 cats in a cat cafe in California between August 2020 and June 2022 and reported on 186 feline-feline interactions. In those interactions, they observed nearly 300 distinct expressions of the cats and 45% were deemed to be friendly expressions while 37% were somewhat aggressive. According to the co-author of this article, Brittany Forkowitz, an evolutionary psychologist at Leon College in Arkansas, their communication demonstrated that cat communication is much more complex than we assumed. And they hope to expand their research to include feral communities, multi-cat households, and learn more about the various expressions that cats make when communicating with, with each other. And one more cat story for today. Did you realize that your domestic cat has evolved into one of the most successful and diverse species on the planet? Yep, that's according to Dr. Jonathan Loso's new book, The Cat's Meow, How Cats Evolved from the Savannah to Your Sofa. As a featured guest of AMC's Usdan Institute, Dr. Losos gave a wonderful presentation about unraveling the secrets of the cats, past and present. And he shares how cats are transforming the world around them. You can stream this cat presentation on AMC's website, 
again, www.amcny.org. And we will put the link in our show's notes as well. And now it's time for questions from our listeners. Our first question comes from Richard. Richard asks, what can I give my dog to calm down from her constant tracheal cough? So tracheal collapse is a really common problem in dogs, especially small breed dogs. So some things that you can do to try and calm down that cough are to have your dog wear a harness, not a collar, that's pulling on their windpipe every time they pull on their leash. That will help to decrease the irritation. Medications to decrease the cough, the best ones are by prescription. And so Richard needs to see his veterinarian to get a prescription for cough medicines to help calm down the tracheal cough. And another thing that can be done to help dogs with tracheal coughs is you can put a stent in the trachea. That's a little special medical wire device that goes into the trachea and pops open so that the trachea stays open, easing your dog's breathing and helping to eliminate that chronic tracheal cough. If you're interested in more information on tracheal collapse, there is a video featuring AMC's Dr. Chick Weiss uh, on our website, and that will give you a lot of information about this disease in dogs. Hope, Richard, that's helpful to you and your pooch. Next question today comes from Jesus. Jesus asks, my puppy has swollen paws and a swollen leg. What is the problem? So Jesus, there's a lot of things that can cause swollen paws and a swollen leg. Uh, one would be that uh, we see dogs who walk too much on hot pavement and then their paws are swollen and their feet are really sore because of walking on the hot pavement. Sometimes dogs will get a disease called polyarthritis, which means they have multiple swollen joints and that might show up as swollen paws or a puppy that has essentially rickets, not enough vitamin D might have swollen paws and legs. Certainly a swollen leg would make us worry in a puppy that it has some sort of fracture, but Jesus doesn't mention that the, the puppy's not using the leg and usually a fractured leg, the dog would carry the leg rather than walk on it. So I think Jesus needs to see a veterinarian and have someone figure out what's wrong with this puppy because it really sounds quite sick to have swollen paws and a swollen leg. Good luck, Jesus. I hope your puppy's on the mend very shortly. Our third question today comes from Angie. Angie asks, I have a rescued pit bull mix. We have no idea what the father looks like. The mother was pit bull, but my dog is approximately seven years old now and has had one litter and this past couple of years, she has gotten a soft tissue tumor on her underbelly and very near her anus. I read your article about a lipoma tumor, non-malignant, that can be confused with lymphoma, and a test can be done to diagnose it called cytology. Could you explain a little bit more about what it is, the procedure, and how costly it is? Thank you. So Angie, this is a great question. Cytology is one of our most cost-effective tests that veterinarians have to offer pet owners. It's quite simple and can be done by any veterinarian. You take a needle, um, about the same kind of needle you would use to give a vaccination, and you put it into the lump that you're interested in figuring out what it is. Some veterinarians like to test the lump by aspirating back using a syringe attached to the needle. And other times veterinarians just stick the needle in and out really quickly to gather some cells inside the lumen of the needle. In either case then, the cells that are inside that needle are squirted out onto a microscope slide and then we send them to the laboratory. And a special veterinarian called the clinical pathologist reviews what those slides look like under the microscope. And so that's not a terribly expensive test because it's easy. It uses equipment that 
every veterinarian has syringes, needles, and microscope slides. And every veterinarian also has access to a clinical pathology laboratory, whether it's like at AMC inside our building or whether it's a send out lab. And there are terrific clinical pathologists who look at cytology slides and then report back on whether or not the bump that's being tested is a cancerous one or not. So this, and it doesn't require anesthesia. That's, that's the other thing that makes people really happy when they have uh, a cytology done is their pet doesn't need to be anesthetized. Our last question today comes from Victoria. Victoria asks, I have these things showing up on my cat for quite a long time now. I've taken them to the vet, but they say that there's nothing wrong. I believe I also have it. If I send you a picture, can you tell me what it is? It resembles a worm. So Victoria, I'm not sure that I can look at a picture of a pet that I haven't seen in person and then make a diagnosis. Um, that is one of the things that's really important in the state of New York is that the veterinarian providing a diagnosis has a client-patient relationship. Client-patient meaning I see you and your pet and I make a diagnosis. So I'm not sure that I can help you even if you send me a picture. One of the things that I am concerned about is could these be tapeworms? Tapeworms look like little bits of rice, often on the back of a dog or cat's leg. Um, and sometimes if you look at them, they kind of move around. Then they dry out and look more like rice. So if that's what you're seeing, I think maybe that your cat has tapeworms and that is 100% treatable by an oral medication. If you took your cat to your veterinarian and these worms that you're worried about were not on the cat at the time, maybe you can share the picture with your regular veterinarian because they're the ones with whom you have this veterinary client patient relationship and they would be the ones to interpret that picture to make a diagnosis. So I hope this information helps you and that your vet can get your cat back on the mend uh, really soon. And now it's time for a break. And when we come back, we'll have news from the USDAN Institute and the Animal Medical Center. We're back with Dr. Ann Hohenhaus on Ask the Vet. Hi, and welcome back to Ask the Vet. Did you know that massage therapy has a wide range of physical and mental benefits for your dog? I'm not talking about you, which might be a different story, but my job is to take care of dogs. So that's what we're going to talk about. It's also, massage is also a wonderful way to strengthen the bond you have with your canine buddy. Earlier this month, the Animal Medical Center's USDAN Institute held an exciting event at New York City's Museum of the Dog. Now, if you haven't been to the Museum of the Dog, it's actually very close to Grand Central Station. It is a terrific museum with all kinds of great dog art. And there's a chair there. I shouldn't say this on the radio, but there's this chair there that would be so good in my living room. It's got dog heads and dog feet, dog heads on the arms and dog feet holding the chair off the ground. It is a terrific chair that I really want. Um, so this event at the AKC Museum of the Dog features AMC's Lilani Alvarez, who's the director of the Tina Santi Flaherty Rehabilitation and Fitness Service here at AMC. There were 50 people and 29 dogs in attendance, and Dr. Alvarez demonstrated massage techniques that pet parents can do at home with their dog. And she also discussed the benefits of massage therapy and how to incorporate these techniques into your dog's daily routine. Lucky for you, we captured all of this on video, and so you can stream this event in your entirety and learn to massage your dog just by logging on to AMC's website, Again, www.amcny.org, and you can find the link in our show notes. Diabetes is a chronic condition that can be challenging for pet parents to navigate. So to help you understand the disease, we have AMC's Dr. Elizabeth Appleman. She's a senior veterinarian and specialist in internal medicine at AMC, and she was the featured speaker at a recent USDAN pet health event where she discussed the diagnosis and treatment of diabetes mellitus in dogs and cats and how to recognize the signs of this disease early to help you better manage your pet's condition. 
Once again, you can stream this entire video on AMC's website. And all you do is put in our search bar, use Dan events. If you're new to the Ask the Vet podcast, the USDAN Institute for Animal Health Education provides monthly free health events, pet health articles, video tutorials, and other pet parent educational resources. To find this and more, just visit amcny.org backslash USDAN Institute. I'd like to take this moment to thank my special guest, Jane Kopelman, for joining me today here on Ask the Vet along with everyone who has downloaded our Ask the Vet podcast. Because of everyone's support, the Ask the Vet podcast is ranked number four on Feedspot's 2023 Top 45 Pet Health Podcasts. Don't forget that if you've got a question about your pet's health, just like the ones we answered a few moments ago, you can email me your question at askthevet at amcny.org and I will answer your question on next month's Ask the Vet show. Don't forget to check us out on social media. On Facebook, it's The Animal Medical Center. On Twitter, it's AMCNY, and the same on Instagram, AMCNY. Especially look at the Halloween photos. All the doctors in the hospital and the nurses and the assistants and everyone dressed up for Halloween, and the costume pictures are just fabulous. My favorite, but it didn't win, was the interns dressed up as um, spotted lantern flies. There were little flies all over the hospital. I hope you'll like and subscribe to make sure you receive new episodes of Ask the Vet podcast. And if you wouldn't mind, I'd love it if you could take a moment to give us a review. I hope everyone will join me next month for another Ask the Vet podcast. Thanks, everyone, and have a great month. See you later. Bye.